This is I'm Stark, and in this video we will be looking at Henry the Seventh and English society in Tudor England. So, first of all, it's good to mention that there was a basic hierarchy, and in simple, the king was at the top, followed by the nobility, then the gentry, then the commoners, and then the labourers, and the church would have its own class system. But English society was not as hierarchical as in France or in Spain, and this was mainly because of a black death in 1348, which obviously killed a lot of people, and this meant that there was less divide between the classes. Now this would have alarmed many of the upper class who are normally getting everything because of their hereditary right. Now the Tudors also marked the growth of the bourgeoisie, who are also known as the middle class, and they were gradually becoming more important. But the king was obviously the most important, and he ruled upon the divine right of kings, which meant that the monarch would rule on behalf of God. So the first sector I'll talk about is the nobility, and nobility consisted of only around 50 men, yet they had considerable influence as well as owning vast amounts of land. And when a noble died, the inheritance of rules of primogeniture meant that lands were passed on to the nearest um, eldest son or male relative. However, when a peerage family died out, which is a nobility family, they were usually replaced by a family who would have bought the king's favour by basically being in his good books. However, we already know from a previous video that Henry VII was wary of the nobility and it was only trusted Lancastrians who he ever trusted and had any influence over him. So, in order to limit the power of the nobility, he used things such as bonds and in acts, acts of attainder, for example, and he also attacked uh, retainers, uh, retainers. However, if you don't know about this, then watch my nobility video. So, below the nobility were the greater gentry, and these were gentlemen who commonly lived in large areas of land and large houses. And there were some extremely important members of the gentry, such as Sir Reginald Bray, who obviously granted a knighthood. And he was the brainchild of the Council of Leonard Law, which we learned about in another video. So the majority of the greater gentry would be uh, forced to assist in military obligations when there was a war. And you were considered part of this greater gentry if you possessed a knighthood, um, if you had a considerable income or an extremely large residence. Now, below the greater gentry were just esquires and mere gentry, and these, to be honest, had more, common, um, had more in common with just the common yeomen, and they were more numerous. So, then we have the commoners, and at the top of the commoner level, there was what was called the middling sort, and these were often people who were lawyers or um, worked with wealthy merchants. Now, lower down the scale were people like shopkeepers and skilled, uh, skilled tradesmen who still played a large role in town councils. And in the countryside, they were those who farmed on small areas of land down to the peasants who were landless. So commoners ranged from uh, big professions such as lawyers down to simple uh, peasants. Now, there, all, there were also husband men who kept small amounts of land and they supplemented their income by working for people like the gentry. But the Black Death had also reduced the value of land, and this led to increased amounts of poverty. Now, the labourers were at the bottom of the class system, and they had to rely on demand for their labour. So obviously this was insecure, as if there was no demand for their labour, they would go out of business. So now we're going to talk about the church, which was another um, on another sort of level and not really uh, connected with this class system. And the church was extremely important as both a spiritual place, but also as a landowner. And the head of a church was the Pope, and this was followed by cardinals who were nominated by the Pope, archbishops who were senior churchmen in individual countries, bishops who are regional leaders of the church, and clergymen, which are people like the priests. And the social status of the clergy could range from lower parish level, who gain little reward, to bishops or abbots who had political roles in uh, government. And we already know that Henry VII liked to appoint people from the church, and he normally appointed bishops who had uh, legal training rather than those just based on sp uh, spirituality. And two important clergymen who he appointed were John Morton and Richard Fox. And they both managed the crown's succession to Henry VIII and were very important throughout his reign. So finally, I will talk a little bit about the regional divisions in England. 
um, because compared to other countries, England didn't contain that many divisions um, as it was a fairly united country. It's quite a small country, so they were fairly united. However, the divisions did come in agriculture. And this was because the east of the country was focused on mixed farming, uh, whereas the west was mainly focused on pastoral farming, which was livestock. Now, the north was also known for their ferocity, while the south were ren renowned for their um, riches. So there were also a few stereotypes, which still exist today, if you think about it. Um, but the local government was also slightly different as um, justice was administered at a, count, uh, at a county level. However, obviously, these are very small divisions and ones that you are commonly see today. So they were not as big as other countries um, at this time. So thank you for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye.